All right, you guys, here we are, the coronavirus episode. It feels like the world is ending a little bit. It feels like an apocalypse of sorts, and let's talk all about it. I'm gonna give you my perspective on this as a physician, as a human, as a compatriot, and as somebody that's interested in these ideas, but is not formally trained in immunology or virology or epidemiology, though I have experience in all those things from my medical school training. So all of you will know that I'm a medical doctor, I'm an MD, and that I wrote a book called The Carnivore Code. It is about nutrition and diet. These are things I think about. One of the most insightful things I saw anyone on Twitter say was, why are we trying to cordon off? Why are we trying to silo the experts on this issue? Who is the expert when we are dealing with a new infection? In a sense, there are people who are trained in epidemiology or virology and all of these other fields. And I just hope to be able to add something to that conversation from my perspective. You guys can know where I'm coming from. You know my education. You know my background. I'm not claiming to be anything I'm not. I'm not claiming to be a necromancer or a future predictor or anyone that has wild circus tricks here. I'm just claiming to be someone that's very interested in these issues. And if you find my opinions valuable, then I am happy to contribute them to the best of my ability as a trained physician. You will all also know that I am formally trained in psychiatry and that mental health uh, sometimes connects with infectious disease. There are certainly some infectious diseases uh, like strep infections that can affect the brain and cause things like pandas syndrome, but that in residency, we didn't often talk about infection, but we talk about it a lot in medical school. I think that the overarching perspective with which I approach many of these things is that in a way, so much of what we are doing in general in the health space and autoimmunity, and now with this coronavirus infection, everyone is self-taught. When we're trying to help people improve autoimmunity, when we're trying to help people improve any condition that we don't have an answer for in Western medicine, which is a heck of a lot of things, we are all self-taught. And I have formal training in medicine. As I said, I'm an MD. So maybe I have some ability to speak about this, but I don't want to claim to be anything I'm not. And if my opinion is valuable to you, then I hope to be able to offer my appraisal of the situation in this video, in this podcast, however you are listening to me. And I've so appreciated all of your support. And if, I'm so glad that my work can be valuable to people and help add uh, richness to lives in general. That is all I want to be able to do. So in this podcast, as I said in the introduction, I'm going to start out with kind of my perspective on coronavirus, the overarching frame of this, uh, give some ideas of where we are right now, the overall zeitgeist, which is kind of the overall societal perspective, what we are all thinking about right now. And I want to talk about the virus itself, what it is, how it infects us, what it means for us, how it injures us, who it injures, why it's a problem, and what I think the greatest implications of this virus may be moving forward. In the last half of the podcast, I wanna talk about some speculation regarding connecting the dots, uh, ideas about nutrition connecting with immunology, what we know, what we don't know, and what we can do to be the healthiest humans we can possibly be and have the most robust immune systems. No one has studied the coronavirus with regard to diet, but we've studied influenza viruses and other illnesses, many of them with regard to uh, diet, nutrition, metabolic sensitivity, metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance. I want to get into all of that because I think that they are relevant to this conversation in many ways. And as we will talk about in the first section of this podcast, this YouTube video, wherever you are watching this or listening to this, there is evidence from those in China and now those in the US and other countries that people who have insulin resistance, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, are suffering from this illness much more. They are much more greatly affected by the coronavirus. So this is not something to ignore. And I think that generally speaking, the idea of living a healthy life has been left out of the conversation. And I hope to be able to add this. So I hope you guys will find that valuable as well. And I will offer some of my thoughts about who in our lives needs to be most concerned about this and what we can do. I will certainly not end this podcast without giving you guys a very clear idea of what I'm doing, who I'm worried about in my life, and what we can all do as we move through this challenging time and not lose our poise, our grace, and our peace and our happiness throughout it. So with all that said, let's just begin at the beginning. So I heard this great quote the other day from Thich Nhat Hanh, who is an amazingly beautiful Vietnamese Buddhist monk, 
Um, he, his writing is beautiful. His thoughts are beautiful. And I heard this on the Tim Ferriss podcast in which Tim was talking to Jack Cornfield. And the quote is, when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remained calm and centered, it was enough. It showed the way to everyone to survive. It showed everyone how to survive. And I thought this was so cool. I think that in general, the media is mostly focused on hysteria and fear. And if it is possible, I am hoping to be one of the many voices at this point who are calling for some peace and some poise and clarity and calmness amidst what is surely, surely a storm. And so I hope that that will be the tone for this podcast. As you guys know from listening to me, if you've seen any of my material, I'm a pretty happy guy. I'm, uh, I'm full of energy. I like to be positive. It's just something that defines who I am as a human. And I will continue to be happy and positive throughout all of this because that is who I am. If there is any happiness and positivity or uh, levity in this podcast, it is in no way, shape, or form meant to disrespect the gravity of what we are facing now. And it is in no way, shape, or form meant to marginalize what we are facing now. And I'll give you my perspective on what we're facing now in a moment. So, but I also want to bring some happiness to this. I had a thought this morning and I posted about it on Instagram. If you want to see that video, even in the most dire of circumstances, there is beauty, there is joy, there is gratitude that we should all have for being able to live this life. I saw this amazing video of people in Italy and then also in China singing and chanting from balconies. And I thought that is amazing. I love that spirit of the Italian people. Many of you may know based on my last name, Saladino, I'm mostly Italian. I'm at least half Italian. Uh, my family is from Sicily and I, I love the spirit of the people there and they were singing from the balconies and I thought, this is amazing. This is humans coming together. If there's nothing else we can all do in this time of real crisis, and I think that's what we're approaching at this point, we can find a time to band together ideologically, spiritually, perhaps not always physically with social distancing, but as humans, we can realize that we are all in this together. None of us is getting out of this alive. We are all on this earth as a result of some miraculous occurrence, however we define it, um, and that we are all sharing a beautiful life. And whether it ends tomorrow or in 10 years or in 70 years, I hope that we can all be grateful for that and realize that we need to cultivate the joy within us. And I hope that as this goes on, and I think it will for a number of weeks, we will all remember those things and not forget to do things that we enjoy, to find the joy, to cultivate the joy, and to remember to appreciate the moments that we are alive however long they last. So those two things are really the, the two beacons, the two candles, if you will, that I wanted to light at the beginning of this podcast to give people a sense of, of how I want us all to approach this with, with grace and with poise, without panic. And I hope to be able to add some degree of um, information that will help people not panic. And also to realize that even when things are uh, seeming as though they are crisis and dangerous and everything is kind of going haywire around us, remember to return to our roots and to find the joy and the happiness that is always within us. Like that's good. I want to see people dancing and playing and being happy because there is no reason for us not to continue to do that. And I fear that over the coming weeks, if we remain socially isolated, that a lot of people will get lonely and depressed. And I want us to remember that there is still joy within us. So this is a different intro than I usually give to my podcast, you guys, and I hope that it's been helpful. And at this point, I would like to transition to uh, some discussion of what a virus is, what the coronavirus is, and break this all down in detail in a way that I hope will be helpful for all of you. So I think that the first question many people may be asking is what the heck is a coronavirus? What is this thing that is besieging us? Is it like the common cold? Is it like the flu? The answer to both of those is really no and yes at the same time. The common cold is a type of coronavirus. It is not this coronavirus. As we will talk about later in this podcast or this video, this coronavirus is different. This coronavirus is now being called SARS-CoV-2. Um, there is a previous coronavirus called SARS-CoV-1, which caused 
SARS syndrome uh, in the previous history of humans in both in China and other countries had SARS. There are other coronaviruses, specifically MERS, M-E-R-S, which stands for Middle East Respiratory Distress Syndrome, and SARS stands for Systemic, excuse me, SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, as you guys will see, this podcast is probably not going to be edited because of the way that we are doing the timing. So I'm just kind of recording it straight through and we'll see what happens. But SARS and MERS are previous coronaviruses and uh, they are both pretty virulent. We will talk about the virulence of SARS-CoV-2, which is the one we're dealing with now, relative to SARS-CoV-1 and MERS shortly. I wanna show you guys some pictures. If you are watching this on YouTube, you will see these. If you are not, you can refer to that video. But I wanna show some pictures of the coronavirus. And the reason this is called a coronavirus is because of this halo or corona of protein spikes out here around the membrane, which are um, the namesake. And these are proteins, which I will show you in a moment. But basically, here's another picture of a coronavirus. You can see these, this halo of spike glycoproteins inserted into the lipid bilayer membrane here. There are other proteins in the lipid bilayer. Uh, in this depiction of a generalized coronavirus, there is an M protein, a chemagglutin esterase dimer, and, uh, and an E protein. And inside of the membrane is an RNA, single-stranded RNA uh, molecule, which is really the genetic material of a virus. So what the heck is a virus in the first place? A virus is amazing. <laughs> in some ways, except when it causes us problems. The question that we always asked in medical school was, is a virus alive? A virus needs a host organism's machinery to reproduce. So the question becomes, is a virus alive if it can't reproduce on its own? It seems to want to replicate itself. It's one of these mysteries of the universe, why these things even exist. But viruses require host machinery. Viruses affect animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, humans, there are these particles floating around that can use our machinery to reproduce. And this is really a pretty incredible and at times stressful thing when they cause us harm. So viruses can't really live on their own. Without a host, a virus doesn't die. Those statements, of course, presume that a virus is alive in the first place. This gets into the murky territory of things like prions as well. I'm not really going to talk about prions in this podcast. Prions are kind of like protein viruses in a way. that They're just a protein that gets into our body and causes other proteins to misfold in connection with that protein. So prions and viruses are sometimes compared to each other, but a virus is a little more complex than a prion per se. So uh, again, I'll move back to the, um, the, on the screen, the video here, and show you guys a life cycle, the life cycle of a, um, of a coronavirus. So what you can see here is this is the coronavirus that we described. It has a lipid membrane into which are inserted various proteins, which will bind to uh, receptors on the surface of host cells. And then the RNA from the virus is incorporated into the cell. Now, remember the RNA from a coronavirus is a single strand of RNA and it's a positive strand. Now, both RNA and DNA are double-stranded molecules. They have two complementary strands uh, that will stick together like a ladder. Technically speaking, humans use DNA as our genetic material, which is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into proteins. This virus and many viruses, which are RNA-based, but not all viruses, some viruses use DNA, this virus uses RNA, and it only has a single strand of RNA, meaning one half of that ladder is present in the virus. So the first thing that ladder does when it gets into the cell, that RNA material, is it makes it uses the host ribosome to make a protein. And that protein it makes is a viral polymerase. And that viral polymerase makes the complementary strand of that RNA. Perhaps this is a little too technical. Basically, the RNA from a coronavirus gets into our cells, it uses our machinery to make a protein that that protein then makes a complementary strand for the single strand of the RNA, 
in the coronavirus. Now it's a double-stranded RNA where there's both a positive and negative strand RNA in our bodies from the virus. This is separate genetic material from humans. And those, again, use our intrinsic uh, ribosomes to make proteins, the proteins of the virus. So the virus basically makes itself in our cells. Then it uses our membranes to make new viruses. And then those viruses are released from our cells. So a virus kind of hijacks our body, makes itself, and then replicates and moves on. It's a delicate, interesting, intricate process. And some viruses are better at this than others. Some viruses are more infective than others. If a virus kills its host too quickly, it won't be able to replicate. Viruses like SARS and MERS, which were also coronaviruses, were more virulent and appeared to kill more of the hosts. That makes them less transmissible because there are less people to transmit them because they are dying so rapidly. Ebola is another example of this. Very, uh, very virulent and killing the host so rapidly that it doesn't spread as much. So if a virus is less lethal to the host, then it's likely to be distributed more widely in the population. But the idea is that the virus is doing this process. It is hijacking our cellular machinery to make itself and reproduce in the general population or in ours, and then we are spreading it to other people. So that is what a virus is. That is essentially what the coronavirus is and how it hijacks us. Now, one of the things I talked about in this explanation of how a virus gets into our cells and what it does inside of us is there's a binding, there's a docking of those proteins, those surface proteins on the coronavirus that form the halo onto our cells. Specifically, coronavirus appears to bind to cells in our lungs and cells in other places in our body, uh, potentially the GI tract as well, which have the ACE2 receptor. This is the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, or the um, ACE2 receptor. So it is binding to angiotensin 2 uh, receptor, essentially. And I know that all of this gets a little complex with the jargon, but I'll try and break it down for you guys a little bit. Um, the, as I said, the S, S spike protein on the surface of the coronavirus shown here, SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor on the surface of cells. And that is what initiates the uh, entry of the virus into the human body. Now, what is, what is ACE2? How does it play into everything? How does this affect hypertension? and so many of these issues that we are being told are connected with the coronavirus. So I'll show you guys one more graphic here, um, still on the share. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is how our body regulates a couple of things, specifically how it regulates fluid, and one of the ways in which our body regulates blood pressure. As you'll see here, the liver makes angiotensinogen, which is converted to angiotensin 1 by renin. Renin is produced by the kidneys in response to decreased perfusion at the level of an apparatus in the kidney called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which sort of senses fluid volume and the electrolyte balance in the human body. So that is the JGA. Um, and if the body makes renin, the renin is going to convert angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is then converted to angiotensin 2 by the enzyme ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. Some of you may have heard of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. In people who have hypertension, these medications will stop this conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, the ACE2 receptor, ACE2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2, uh, is not shown in this diagram, but it degrades angiotensin 2 into uh, angiotensin 1 7. And that is not necessarily important, other than the fact that angiotensin 1 7 can block the actions of angiotensin 2. So, why is this important? Because the um, the lungs may produce angiotensin-converting enzyme, and the lungs and many other tissues of the body, specifically the kidney and the gut, also have this ACE2, this ACE2 enzyme that degrades angiotensin-2. 
As you can see in people with hypertension, angiotensin II increases sympathetic activity. This is the fight or flight nervous system. It increases the resorption of sodium, potassium, uh, and chloride, which increases our blood pressure as we hold on to minerals, electrolytes. It causes the adrenal gland to increase aldosterone, which is another hormone in our body that also has us hold on to tubular sodium, potassium chloride, et cetera. It leads to arteriolar vasoconstriction, and it's going to cause our pituitary gland, the gland in our brain, to secrete an enzyme called antidiuretic hormone, which causes water resorption. So in people who have hypertension, we use these medications, the ACE inhibitors, this is essentially the ACE1 inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme one inhibitors to prevent the conversion of angiotensin one to angiotensin two and thus lower the blood pressure by uh, eliminating all of these downstream effects. Now, with regard to coronavirus, we're looking at ACE2 as the, uh, the transmembrane or the enzyme in the membrane of these lung cells, specifically in the gut, by which the virus binds and enters our body. Why is this relevant? Because um, it appears that people on ACE inhibitors, it, we're not totally clear about this, but people on ACE inhibitors may have worse outcomes because by inhibiting the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, process, the ACE1 with these ACE inhibitors, it appears that our body might upregulate ACE2 in our lungs, causing more uh, regions where the coronavirus can bind to our body and enter. So this may be one of the reasons that our uh, that people with hypertension don't do well with coronavirus. There are probably other reasons which we will get to soon, specifically insulin resistance. But it, it is an interesting thing that has come up a lot is this ACE2 receptor. And perhaps we will develop something that blocks it in the future and prevents uh, the, the binding of the coronavirus and can improve these outcomes. But for now, the general recommendations are that people who are on ACE inhibitors for blood pressure not stop them, but that we certainly not give ACE inhibitors to anyone uh, to prevent the coronavirus from spreading. There's another class of medications called angiotensin receptor blockers, ARBs, and we don't know how these affect it, but they're all involved in the way that the coronavirus is entering our cells. So specifically entering what appear to be type two pneumocytes in the lungs, and when the virus enters these cells, it causes an immune reaction. And is that immune reaction often an over-aggressive immune reaction that causes damage to the lungs? So the majority of the symptoms of coronavirus, which I'll go over in a moment, are lung-related. Generally, it's cough and shortness of breath. It can also be fever and some other symptoms. But the most of the damage that people are experiencing is breathing. It's in the lungs because of these coronavirus binding to the ACE2 receptor causing these cells to get damaged. And then these are often the cells that also produce something called surfactant, which, which decreases the surface tension of the alveoli, little grape-like sacs in the lungs that cause, that expand. That's where we do gas exchange. That's how we breathe is these little clusters of grapes in the lungs at the very end of all of our you know, bronchioles, at the very end of your lung where you inhale all of your air is this kind of sac-like structure called the alveoli. These type two pneumocytes in the alveoli secrete surfactant that helps decrease the surface tension. They stay open. When those are destroyed by the coronavirus, then the surfactant is decreased and they collapse and you get what appears to be what we are seeing or what people are seeing called uh, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is sort of a, an occlusion, a uh, filling of the lungs with um, the collapsed alveoli and immune tissue causing a whiteout on imaging of the lungs. So that's probably what's going on with regard to coronavirus in the lungs, how it's causing injury to us and what it's doing, at least in that part of our body. So I wanna move on to um, an explanation of symptoms so that we all know, I think this is really important to consider what symptoms this causes because we need to know uh, what this virus may be causing us and know when we may be afflicted by the virus or when we should think about getting testing. So let's talk about the symptoms of coronavirus a little bit. So for this, I will refer to a WHO report of the symptoms, which is reproduced here in an article on Vox for those watching the, the um, uh, YouTube video, but you'll see this is from the World Health Organization 2020 report of the WHO China Joint Mission on Coronavirus. 
this is important, fever, 87.9% of people. This is the most common signs and symptoms in 55,924 laboratory confirmed cases of COVID-19. I should have said at the beginning of this podcast that COVID-19 is the name of the disease and SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the organism. So when we're talking about COVID-19, this is the illness. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. And so this is only up to February 22nd, 2020. As is the case, this podcast is being reported on the uh, 16th of March and anything after this could not be considered to be accurate. These data points that I'm gonna present in the future here are often connected with many previous reports, but they are the best we have at this moment. From this 55,924 laboratory confirmed cases, we see fever in 87.9%, which means that if you feel sick, and I will talk about this in a moment, and you don't have a fever, then you may not have coronavirus. Let's talk about the rest of the symptoms so you can correlate all of these together. Dry cough, 67.7%, fatigue, 38%. So basically, the majority of patients had a fever and a dry cough. If you are feeling ill and you don't have a fever or a dry cough, the chances are you may not have coronavirus. Now, why am I mentioning this? I'll go through the rest of the symptoms in a second, but I think there is a lot of wisdom to be gained from the actions of Japan. And I will show some charts from Japan in a moment, but what we know from Japan or South, uh, South Korea can be seen in this graphic. As you can see here, the, these lines are Italy, France, Germany, Spain, US, and Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. These days are a little different, right? So we're looking at days from March the 9th, 2020, and we're going back. So the end of this graph is March the 9th, 2020, going back 20 days. This black line at the bottom is Japan. The confirmed cases of SARS-CoV-2 are much less in Japan. We are trending exactly online with all of these other European countries. What did Japan do differently than the rest of us? They focused on clustered cases and they actually recommended that people not go to the emergency room unless they were severely ill. And so as we will talk about, I think everyone listening to this knows that the main focus of prevention of spread of coronavirus right now is hand washing and social distancing, which social isolation is what I was gonna say, and it's essentially the same thing. So we should be washing our hands, we should be distancing ourselves socially, we should not be going into big groups, and if we are feeling sick, we need to realize that unless it's very severe, there may not be anything to be done in an emergency room. Some of, many people are recommending now that if there are young people or healthy people who get symptoms of coronavirus, that they just stay home. You may not need to go to the emergency room. You may not need to go to the hospital where you can spread it to more people uh, if you do not need to. Many healthy people, as I will talk about in a moment, will get this and will recover just fine. Certainly if someone is frail or elderly or infirmed and they are not breathing well or they are having issues, in that case, you need to go to the hospital, go to the hospital. But there is some legitimacy to the recommendation that if you are healthy and you are having symptoms of coronavirus, you may not need to go to the hospital. You may not need to get tested to confirm it. You should isolate yourself for a few weeks. That appears to have been what Japan did. Japan focused on the clusters and tried to isolate the people who were spreading the disease and remove them from further contacts. And we can talk more about that. But there are different strategies in the way that people are managing this. And clearly, Japan is doing a much better job. In the US, we are trending like the European countries, which have had a huge uptick. So this is a very interesting nuance in the way that it can all be handled. Let's go back to the symptoms. So if we return to the graphic of the symptoms of coronavirus, like I said, fever, 87.9%, dry cough, 67.7%, fatigue, 38.1%. It's a respiratory virus. It's going to cause these, which are flu-like. Again, it's not the flu. It's different. It's certainly more virulent. We're going to talk about that too. Sputum production, 33.4%. So the majority of people are going to get these symptoms, although these are smaller, these are less than the majority, this 38.1 and 33.4, but certainly the majority of people are gonna get fever and dry cough. 
And I think it's reasonable that if we are healthy and we get these symptoms that we just stay home and isolate and maybe don't go out, don't spread it to healthcare workers, we may not need to go to the hospital. Certainly if people are having issues, then go to the hospital. But if not, be aware that if you have the coronavirus, anytime you move, you could spread it. So maybe just stay home, do supportive care, which we can talk about at the end of this podcast. Generally, fluids, rest, relax. If you are healthy, your body will probably deal with this just fine. Other symptoms, shortness of breath in a, sm in a smaller amount of people, 18.6, joint pain, sore throat, headache, chills. These are now 13, 11%. Nausea and vomiting, 5%. Nasal congestion, 4.8. Diarrhea, 3.7. Generally speaking, this is not a virus that is going to cause a stuffy nose, sneezing, nausea, or diarrhea. They're rare, and they can be a part of this symptom, but these are not what coronavirus looks like. It looks like this. It looks like fever and dry cough. I think this is very important for people to know so that they can identify what the virus syndrome may be and realize whether or not they need to go to the hospital or whether they should stay home and let the body take care of itself. Let's talk a little bit about how the virus is transmitted. So what we know now is still evolving. As I said in the beginning of this podcast, this is a novel virus. We are all learning. We are all trying to share valuable information. There are a couple of things that are important to note here, however. It's not clear whether this is droplet or aerosol. And that, what that means is that it can be spread just by breathing in the same room as someone else. It looks like it could be respiratory droplet, but perhaps not aerosol. Aerosolization of a virus means it can get onto much smaller particles in the air and can travel much further. Droplet precautions, generally speaking in medical school, mean you have to be much closer to someone for it to be a problem and that it's not as infective across distances. What we know now is evolving, but it appears that this is probably a droplet, but not an aerosol spread problem. That's a good thing because aerosol is much wider distributed. You can get something aerosol from someone being in the same room. A droplet transmission would probably have to be much closer to someone. But then there is the problem of fomites. What the heck is a fomite? <clears throat> a fomite is our fancy medical word for what happens when someone touches their mouth, touches their nose, and gets a piece of the virus or a virus, many virus particles on their hands, and touches something else. They touch a table or a desk or their phone or a shopping cart at the grocery store, that's a fomite. The virus can live outside of our bodies for variable amounts of time on various surfaces. So there's been a lot of discussion about how long can the virus live? Some viruses that we're aware of, like HIV, don't live outside of the body very long at all. They're dead almost immediately when they're outside of our body. But these viruses, coronaviruses, and this is probably what makes things like the flu and uh, common colds, so much more effective is that they can stick around on fomites. And I'll talk about which are probably the most infective fomites in a moment, but I want to show you guys a chart of a study that was recently done. Many of these studies are preprints. They haven't been peer reviewed because it's all coming out so quickly, but nevertheless, this study is pretty interesting. I think it's a preprint from the New England Journal of Medicine. You can see it here. I'll do the screen share. This is essentially the amount of time a coronavirus lives on different surfaces. The red graphics here are HOV, COV-19, which is SARS-CoV-2, which is what we're dealing with now. The blue graphics are SARS-CoV-1, the original SARS infection in 2003 and other years. And you can see that the titers of the populations of the viruses decline rapidly on copper. So what people are noticing is that copper doesn't last very long at all. Cardboard can last up to 24 hours. Steel can last up to 24 hours. Plastic can last even longer. So you can see these graphs, these curves are very different between these things. What we know, we're not touching a whole lot of copper. <laughs> Mostly what we're coming in contact with are things that are synthetic surfaces like a desk, a phone, uh, which are probably on the order of cardboard, steel, or plastic. So it's pretty reasonable to imagine that this virus is going to be on a lot of surfaces that we touch. This is the reason for hand washing. So it's not that we can't go out and do things that we must do if you have to go to the grocery store to get food, which is an essential part of a human life, then you could either wear gloves, or if you don't wear gloves, you can sanitize the cart before you touch it. 
with a wipe and we can talk about what will kill the coronavirus. Many things will kill the coronavirus. It's fairly fragile because it's an enveloped virus. Remember, it has that lipid membrane around it. And, or you can wash your hands when you get home. I would recommend sanitizing the cart before you even touch it at the grocery store or sanitizing the cart before you touch it because we are likely to touch our face uh, even while we are touching our cart in the grocery store. The other thing is that if you are a significant amount of distance away from people at the grocery store, the transmission rates appear to be lower. So the social distancing thing now is being talked about as six feet. So in your family and your loved ones, yeah, you can be within six feet of them, but if we're in public spaces, it's probably prudent to be about six feet from other people, which means you may not wanna to go to a crowded yoga class for a little while and we can talk about how much time this is. You may not wanna be in a big group of people at a concert. I think most people are realizing this. You may not wanna be in a crowded room with people and if you're gonna to touch things, use gloves or use sanitizer, it sounds draconian, which is one of my favorite words, draconian, but this is how we slow the spread and we can talk about why when we get into talking about flattening the curve and the long-term implications of lots of people getting sick quickly with the coronavirus overwhelming the healthcare system. But I think that knowing what surfaces it can be on basically helps us understand that if we're touching anything outside of our home, we should be wiping it down. If we go out in public, you can use a mask, but you probably don't need to. In fact, the mainstream recommendations that I am seeing now are to not use a mask unless you are sick. The mask can actually ask, act as a fomite. And if you touch the mask with your hands, then you can transmit the virus to your face. So again, we're dealing with a lot of challenging things here, and we have to be very careful about how we navigate the world to protect ourselves and our families and the rest of the people, because what we really want to do is just slow the spread of this virus in the short term, and we'll talk about why. So I also want to talk about this graphic, which is a comparison of the fatality rate in a log score to the r naught or the average number of people infected by each sick person. And I think this gives us a sense of why coronavirus is a thing right now. On the y-axis of this, and I posted this on my Instagram as well, if people want to see it, I will put it into the show notes as well for this episode, along with um, other links that I am uh, describing in this podcast, so people can reference that afterwards if they want to see it. On the y-axis of this graph is the fatality rate of various illnesses. These are all viruses on this graph in a logarithmic scale, which means it's not completely spaced in the same way. It's logarithmic. But you can see that the most uh, lethal things, uh, meaning more deadly, are things like bird flu, MERS, which we talked about, SARS, which we talked about, Ebola, and smallpox. These are very high on the fatality log rate score, meaning how many people who contract the virus die, okay? Now, these estimates are tricky, and I want to talk about why this may be very tricky for coronavirus and many of these viruses in general, but you can see with the bird flu, 50% of the people who got it died. With MERS, which is the Mediterranean virus, but about 30-some percent of people who got that died. Ebola is around 50%. SARS is around 10%. Smallpox is somewhere mid, uh, probably around 30%, about the same as the MERS, the Mediterranean virus infection. Now, what we know about coronavirus, I think this is the statistic that everyone wants to know about. What is the fatality rate of coronavirus? The way we calculate a fatality rate is a numerator and a denominator. It's a fraction. The number of people who get the virus and the number of people who die from the virus. Now, as we know from fractions in our schooling, if you... Uh, have a large number of people up top in the numerator who get the virus and a small number of people who die, that fatality rate is going to be very small. Now, what we know from coronavirus now is really only the denominator. We don't have a great estimate, and it will be challenging, I suggest, to really understand the numerator to understand how many people have actually gotten the virus. The reason the fatality rate is important because it gives us an estimate of how much our healthcare system and society may be affected by this virus. If we have a high infectivity rate and we have a high fatality rate, then we could see many people dying. If the fatality rate is lower, 
then we may not have as many deaths on our hands. I think either way, many people are at risk. And I want to be very clear about this at this point in the podcast. I think that we all know people who are at risk for coronavirus. As I've said on my social media, those of us that are healthy are probably at a much lower risk. And critics may say at this point, how do you know that? There are young and healthy people dying from this virus. And I would say to them, I would say, you know, it, everything I've seen, again, this is evolving. This is March 16th, 2020, says that young and healthy people are not really suffering much from this virus. They are getting the virus, but the vast majority of them are clearing it. It's the elderly, the infirm, the diabetics, the hypertensive, those with heart disease, all people who probably have some degree of insulin resistance, some underlying comorbid conditions, some metabolic dysfunction, which we will talk about in the last part of this podcast, who seem to suffer the worst. People with lung conditions may be faring worse as well. And uh, it's interesting to note that in Wuhan, where the virus began, uh, the air is very, very bad. So that's an interesting addition to this conversation. But in general, I think that we don't know the fatality rate of this virus. We only know the people who have sadly died. We don't know how many people have been infected because we don't have good testing. I want to talk about that as well coming up. And many people are either mildly symptomatic and not seeking out testing, or they are simply not going to emergency rooms, maybe as they should not. So we will actually not know how many people are totally being infected. So we can't really put a number on the fatality rate. As you'll see in this graphic, however, estimates are that the fatality rate is between, I would say, 0.5 and 3, and that's a big swing, right? The seasonal flu is about 0.1%, right? The common cold is essentially slightly more than zero. The 2009 flu is slightly more than zero. Polio is less than the seasonal flu. It's less than 0.1 on the y-axis here. The Spanish flu was pretty high. The Spanish flu was about 3%, 4%. So as you can see in this graphic, which is from the New York Times, uh, again, I'll link to it. It's on my Instagram. The, this pink box is where we think coronavirus might land. And so we don't know the actual fatality rate. We're estimating 0.5 to 3. And I think that that's, that's a large range as a conservative estimate. But the key is numerator versus denominator. We won't know how many people are infected and we can't tell that completely. More people will suffer, more people will die from this illness, sadly, than they do the seasonal flu. Absolutely, this is not the seasonal flu. It's more virulent and also appears to be more infective. So infectivity, which is also called R0 or R0, you like the medical terms, uh, is on the x-axis. And as you can see on the x-axis in this graph, this is an average of the number of people that someone with coronavirus or any virus will infect. Measles is way out here to the right on the x-axis. Though it has a case fatality rate less than one, the average person with measles infects 15 to 18 people. Chickenpox is about seven or eight. The common cold is between one and two. The estimates for coronavirus are 2.2 to 3.4 for the r naught. So the combination of being moderately transmissible and being more deadly, more virulent, having a case fatality rate that's higher than the flu make this more of a big deal than the flu, which is why things are happening the way they are. It's the combination of infectivity and virulence that we're trying to figure out. It's evolving every day. Again, we won't know the case fatality rate because we won't know how many people are infected by the virus, but estimates are 0.5 to 3 with most people saying, around 3%. Why does this matter? Then we get into this very interesting realm of epidemiology. And the question, which has been answered, or at least the, has been suggested to be answered by people like Mark Lipsitch, who's an epidemiologist from Harvard, which is how many people will get the virus? Because if we are working with a virus that has an infectivity, which is high, how many Americans might actually get this? How many of us might get this? Well, many people listening to this know that they don't necessarily get a common cold every year. You don't get the flu every year. But there are some people that estimate that 60 to 70% of the population may get coronavirus. Now, once we think about that, and I'll run some numbers in a second, then the case fatality rate starts to be important. And then in, in accuracy in the case fatality rate starts to uh, really 
make it difficult to understand where we will be with all of this when the dust settles and how many people may be negatively affected by coronavirus. So you guys can see here from a perspective, let's see if I can get it to work. So <clears throat> this is Mark Lipsitch, I'll link to his Twitter. He's an epidemiologist from Harvard. He is concerned that coronavirus may infect 70% of the world's population. So if that is the case, then we may want to know what the fatality rate is. So here is the data, right? Say there are 300 million people in the United States. If 60% of people get the coronavirus, we're looking at, you know, 200,000 people getting the coronavirus, essentially 200, 200 million people getting the coronavirus. And if 3% of those people die, then we are looking at a very, very large number of deaths in the United States. Now, as has been cited by others, every year, approximately 2.3 million Americans die from medical causes from illness. So if, if we are imagining that coronavirus is going to kill 3% of the people that it, that it infects at the high end, and 200 million or even 100 million people are affected, the conservative estimates are that a million to three million or more people may die from this virus, which is a pretty big deal when only 2.3 million people in the United States die every year from medical illness or in general. So this is a scary thought. Now, even if we are using the most conservative estimates, say 0.5% of people die from the virus, it's still going to be a big number. Now, we can compare these numbers to the seasonal flu, 55, 75,000 people die every year from the seasonal flu. But what appears to possibly happen with coronavirus is that we may be seeing 10x that amount of deaths of people in this country from the virus. And that is a lot of people. That is a lot of loss of life, which is why the virus is now being taken seriously. Perhaps at this point, it's good to clarify some of the things I previously said on Twitter or some of the things I mentioned uh, in my messaging earlier. As I said at the beginning of this podcast, this is March 16th, everything is evolving. And I've had to sort of reconsider my perspective on a lot of this. And I've seen a lot of this shift as it's clear that this is going to affect a lot of people. I'm not sure that we know it's going to affect 60% of people. I think it certainly may affect less than that if we are able to do social distancing and this control of community uh, involvement of people right now. But the statements that I had made previously on Twitter and Instagram will uh, be relevant to the last part of this podcast, this YouTube video, which is that I think it's important to note that we are not powerless in the face of this virus. And I want to add the conversations around what we can do to have a healthy immune system. As a healthy human, I am personally not worried about illness related to the coronavirus. And that is based on everything I've read about who is getting it and how it's going to hurt them. Uh, perhaps I will be wrong and that will be humbling and I will admit my wrongness, but I think that for healthy humans who do not have pre-existing conditions, this virus will be something that our immune systems can handle. What I am afraid of is transmitting this virus to someone who is weaker. And this is something, again, this is the danger of social media, right? That we make a statement and it can get taken out of context and twisted by other people. I have never meant to suggest that I did not feel that coronavirus might be harmful to those in our lives who are weaker, who are not robust enough to manage uh, their own lives, who do not have good nutritional status, who may be uh, immunologically weak. And so those are the people that we should be thinking of. Even if we are healthy and robust, what is very interesting is this idea of asymptomatic or pseudosymptomatic carriers giving it to people who are less robust and more frail. Again, at the end part of this podcast, I want to talk about which nutritional factors I think are involved in this. I think it's ludicrous to leave nutrition out of this conversation because we know it affects our immunologic tolerance. And the reason that we get frail as we age is not because we age per se, it is because often our nutritional status falters. And that is a hypothesis, but it is also in direct contradistinction to what is told to us in medical schools. And the general messaging is that we get old and we get frail, and those are inextricable. And I disagree with that. I don't think we have to get old and frail at the same time. And the evidence that I would suggest for this is found in indigenous populations. Of course, this is anecdotal, this is anthropologic, this is ethnographic. But I made a statement on Twitter 
that I was not afraid of the coronavirus personally as a physician. But I did not mean I was not afraid of the implications of coronavirus on the medical system or on uh, our uh, economy, only that immunologically, I felt myself to be robust enough to handle the virus. What I did not account for when I made that statement was that I would probably be concerned about transmitting this virus to other people, even if I were immunologically competent. So by not considering that, I probably overstated myself in that uh, that messaging, and I apologize for that. But the messaging, the underlying message there was simply that, like I said with Thich Nhat Hanh, I do not think that those of us that are healthy need to panic at this point. I think we need to band together and realize what we can do to maintain our health and perhaps even help those in our lives who are more frail to be uh, sheltered from the virus or to have better lifestyles. Perhaps this virus, in addition to many other things, is a lifestyle wake-up call for us as a society. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But someone responded to that statement that I made on Twitter and said, would you be worried about the virus if you were 70 years old? And my first thought was, and I've actually told this to Mark, not if I were Mark Sisson, <laughs> not if I were a kick butt 70 year old. And Mark Sisson is not 70. I think he's 67 this year. Uh, he wrote the forward to my book. As you guys know, I, had to, I got to have breakfast with him the other day. He's hale and hearty as ever. So, and I told him this and he laughed. And I will, uh, you know, perhaps without putting words in, in Mark's mouth, I will say that I don't think Mark is concerned for his own health with regard to coronavirus either. Um, and I thought of Mark as a 70-year-old or a 67-year-old. My parents are now 69. They'll be 70 this year. Um, they are both in good health, but not as robust as Mark Sisson. I'm not sure there are many nearly 70-year-olds who are nearly as robust as Mark Sisson, but I would not be scared for my health if I were Mark Sisson. Now, if I were a frail 70 or 80 year old uh, man or woman in a nursing home, that is a cause for concern. And those are the people that we are very much trying to protect at this point. And we can now get into discussions of our healthcare system and how this may burden that moving forward. Uh, I think this is going to be the greatest impact of the virus. I think that most of the concern here is based around the availability of resources in the hospitals. As I mentioned, um, the majority of people who get this illness, and it could be a pretty big number depending on how far it spreads in our population in the United States, which is really all we can control, uh, the majority of people who get this infectious illness will have a mild syndrome and will not need medical care and perhaps should not seek medical care. Again, I'm not suggesting that those with serious symptoms should not seek medical care, only that, um, the, that uh, those who don't have severe symptoms should perhaps not seek medical care. So I'll show you guys an article from Johns Hopkins, um, what U.S. hospitals should do now to prepare for a COVID-19 pandemic. And there are a couple of scenarios here that we can walk through they give two pandemic planning assumptions here. The moderate scenario based on the 1968-like level of virulence uh, for this virus. Um, these are influenza pandemics um, in 1968 or 1957, or a very severe pandemic like the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, the Spanish flu was much more severe than the 1957-1968 flus. In the moderate scenario, which is like 1968, we're looking at, they estimate the same number of people needing medical care, 338 million needing medical care. Again, we don't know how many people will get this illness. If it's 50% of the U.S. population, we're looking at 150 million people getting it, but probably the vast majority of those people not needing medical care. So we don't know how many people will need medical care, but they're estimating 38 million might need medical care. Perhaps it will be less. Uh, perhaps will be more, with 1 million hospitalizations. Well, that's a lot of people going to the hospital over some amount of time, and we can talk about that as well. And in a moderate scenario, only 200,000 of those need the ICU. The ICU is the intensive care unit where they have ventilators. Incidentally, one of the uh, guys I went to medical school with is an anesthesiologist uh, in uh, Southern California now, and he said that his hospital is now canceling elective cases to allow ventilators to be more available should they need them. But there's only so many ventilators in the country, and this is where the main problem arises. 
So in this moderate scenario, there are 200,000 people needing ICU care, and there are 46,500 medical ICU beds in the United States. They say maybe an equal number of beds that could be used in a crisis. So this moderate scenario makes it unlikely that we would have enough room for people in the ICUs. And this is the reason for what is called flattening the curve. I can show you a graph that shows that. We wanna flatten the curve. Even if we are, many of us, going to be infected, we don't want to all be infected at once so that emergency rooms and specifically ICUs are not overwhelmed. Um, emergency rooms are generally going to do supportive care. We can talk about therapies. There's not a whole lot that we have right now for this beyond supportive care, which as many of you will know if you go to the hospital is often an IV just kind of support um, for what you are doing, but no specific intervention. I'm not sure what ERs are doing right now. Specifically, if people have mild symptoms or moderate symptoms, they may just be sending them home to, as we say in the medical world, convalesce, to be sick, to let your body's immune system, which is hopefully robust enough, deal with it all. Uh, there are some therapies that are being trialed or uh, thought about now in more severe cases. We can talk about those, but I wanna show you guys flattening the curve. I'm sure you've all heard of this now, but I will illustrate it for you briefly. There are some great articles on all of this on Vox and Wired. Here's an article on Vox. This is flattening the curve. Daily number of cases on the y-axis, time since the first case on the x-axis. And there is a healthcare system capacity here, which we do not want to exceed as a country. I think this is one of the most important ceilings, if you will, of this thing. And in the situation in which we all get together and uh, don't do some social distancing, the cases without protective measures, social distancing, could spike high, could spike far above the healthcare system capacity. Flattening the curve is this gray curve. Not flattening the curve is this pink red curve. We don't want to outstrip the healthcare system capacity. That would be bad. So here's what we are dealing with. A virus that is virulent, that has a case fatality rate that is most likely, almost certainly higher than the flu, that is more infectious than the flu, and that if everyone gets it at the same time could cause a real crisis for a healthcare system because there won't be enough ICU beds to take care of the people who are in most need of those things, or perhaps hospital services in general to take care of people. So we don't know how many people will get this disease uh, we'll get this illness, but um, if we all get it at once, it's going to be really, really bad. So I think most people understand this now, that we need to spread this out to not overwhelm the healthcare system uh, as best as possible. We need to slow it down. Another piece of this equation is then how we even test for coronavirus. And it should be said that the testing for coronavirus is not great right now. It's not horrible, but it's not fantastic. There are a couple of different tests. In China specifically, they've used uh, CT scans are the most sensitive. When we're talking about testing, we can talk about sensitivity and specificity. Sensitivity is mainly the, the measure of how good something is going to be at telling you whether you have an illness. Specificity is going to be telling us if, there's, if it's actually the illness that we think it is. So in medical school, we say spin and snout. Specificity uh, tells us that it's, if, if it's a specific test and it's positive, it rules it in. If it's a sensitive test and, it negative, and it's negative, it rules it out. So a specific test, if it's positive, rules it in. Now, we don't have a lot of specific tests for coronavirus, meaning that there are going to be some false positives. But what we're more worried about are false negatives. And in that case, we want a sensitive test. And the CT scan appears fairly sensitive, meaning that if you don't see something on a CT scan, if you have a sensitive test like a CT scan, which I believe are in the 90 plus percentage for sensitivity for this virus when people have symptoms, you can see ground glass opacities, which is again, a medical term for what's happening in the lungs of people with this illness. But if we have a sensitive test and it's negative, we can say with 90 to 95% certainty in the case of a CT scan, that person does not have coronavirus. Now, to get a CT scan is difficult. In China, apparently they were running 200 CT scans a day. They were basically running a CT scan every six to seven minutes 
during the worst of it, which is pretty impressive. I don't know that we'll be able to replicate that in the United States. We'll be running our CT scanners all the time. Uh, CT is an, is an exposure to radiation uh, that's not insignificant, but in this case is probably warranted if people are very worried or we need to know the diagnosis. But in general, um, CT scan appears to be the best. Not everyone can get a CT scan. We can't do drive-through CT scans. So what a lot of countries were doing is a swab-based testing in the back of the throat with RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase PCR, uh, trying to amplify the RNA of the coronavirus into DNA and then give a specific signature. Now, the problem with RT-PCR is it may not be as sensitive uh, or specific as we hope it is, and it could lead to lots of false positives. Uh, RT-PCR can also miss people at this point, or if you're incorrectly diagnosed, it may lead to uh, inappropriate quarantine or perhaps inappropriate use of medication, but I think that's the best, that's probably a better thing than underdiagnosis at this point. We want, we would rather have false positives than false negatives. We don't want to miss people so that they don't spread it. So that brings up this other issue that we don't have a, we don't have perfect screening. Even a, a bunch of test kits are going to take time and may not change the course of the disease. My overall perspective on this at this point is that, um, kind of like I said earlier, if we mirror Japan, um, those of us that are young and healthy may not need to seek care. And we should probably all quarantine ourselves and limit our interaction with other people as if we were all kind of carrying the disease for the next one to two weeks until we know what is happening with this uh, so that the, the illness doesn't get out of control. We are trending like Italy right now. And uh, we really need to be careful with this. So I have not talked about the incubation time and the convalescent time with this. We can talk about that as well. Uh, from what I've read, the incubation time appears to be five to six days uh, thereabouts. So if we are not sure if we have the coronavirus right now, if we isolate ourselves for a week, and we don't have symptoms, we can be fairly sure that we don't have it at this point. Now, some of the data coming out of China suggested that once someone does have coronavirus, they can be asymptomatic for five to six days, but still spread the illness during that time, which is probably when most of the spreading happens. And that's why I think what we will see in the next few days is a, uh, a nationwide quarantine or a lockdown or some real, uh, much more strict regulations on where we are allowed to travel just so that we can get a sense of this over the next week. Once people are sick, they will know to isolate themselves and they won't go anywhere because they'll just be in their house. Uh, generally speaking, or in a hospital, hopefully working with healthcare professionals who are in protective equipment. But the day, most dangerous time, if you are listening to this on March 17th, uh, that would be Tuesday, the most dangerous time will be the next week when there are probably thousands of cases of coronavirus that, of people with coronavirus who don't know they have it, who are moving around and spreading it. And so I really think that the answer would be those people that are young and healthy who have symptoms, stay put get better, let the virus do its thing, let your body do its thing. We can talk about the immune system next. Those people who don't appear to have symptoms, we should all probably not travel a whole lot to not infect people, to not touch fomites like we talked about. I had a trip planned for later this week and I'm just canceling all my plane flights. I'm not traveling anywhere. I'm still gonna go out of my house and go in the sun, but I'm gonna try and not be around people with that six foot margin, et cetera, until we know who may have been exposed and who may be carrying the disease so that we can really flatten this curve as it were. So hopefully that makes sense to people with regard to all of that. One of the other questions, which is maybe not as important, but is interesting to address is where the heck did this come from? If you look back at the history of this, it, it does appear perhaps to have originated at the Wuhan seafood market, though there is some suggestion that there are 13 or 14 cases that were not associated with that epidemiologically. So I don't think we know where this came from. Uh, and there are potentially cases as far back as November of 2019. Uh, and then the first cases in Wuhan at the seafood market were, again, the middle of December. You can look at that stuff online. I'm not sure it really matters where it, come from, it came from at this point, beyond the fact that um, my personal opinion is strongly this has nothing to do with eating animals. There are some plant-based advocates who have suggested that if we just never ate animals, none of these diseases would have happened. And this is blatantly false uh, for me because we are still going to come into contact with animals. There's no clear evidence this came from eating animals. But occasionally in the animal kingdoms, viruses do jump from animals. They jump between species. They can jump from animals to humans occasionally. That appears to have been what happened in this case 
The best data I've seen right now, although this is unclear, is that this may be from a bat. There's 96% sequence homology, give or take, on that with the bat. People were saying a penguin, which is not a penguin, a penguin, but the seek, that doesn't appear to be as uh, possible. There's potentially an intermediate host of a certain type of um, what I believe is called a civet, uh, which is like a, a, a type of a wild cat-like uh, animal. So the, it, it appears to have come from animals to humans. We don't know why this happens and then have spread from there. As we know in China, the extreme measures to quarantine, to expand the hospitals, seem to have gotten this under control. But in the United States and many other European countries, cases are increasing very, very rapidly. And I think that we will not know how many people are infected for a few more days. There are a few websites that you can look at to track this, to track the curves that I'll show you guys here. Um, <clears throat> this one is from uh, Johns Hopkins, the coronavirus COVID-19 global cases uh, by the Center for Systems Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins. You can see right now, there's a graphic here I'm looking at on the screen. This is where the cases are in the world. They're basically almost everywhere. There was a case reported today in Greenland, um, and there are cases in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Though if you look at this graph, it's pretty clear that the majority of cases are in the northern hemisphere. We can talk about why that may be, but it does appear that people in the southern hemispheres are still getting this disease. One of the concerns is that there may be a southern hemisphere worsening of this illness uh, in the summer for us and the fall for these other places. Total confirmed cases of coronavirus, 181,580. You can see the numbers here on the left side, China, 81,000, Italy, 27,000. The United States is um, 4,661. You can track that every day. The UK is interesting because they were doing a herd immunity experiment. You can track the UK numbers every day in terms of new cases of the illness. And you can look at all of these. Japan is at 825 on down the list. Um, you can see on the right side, total number of deaths um, in the United States. I believe there are 48 deaths in Washington. Um, there are total 7,000 deaths. And there are 70, close to 79,000 people now who have recovered. And most of them, are, at least, are recorded in China and other places in the world. Um, I believe that there are uh, some people in the U.S. You can see here California, U.S., six people are recorded reported to have recovered in California. There are a number of cases in California right now, I believe 430 at the time this podcast is being recorded. So this is an interesting website to see where it is. What we know is that people have traveled all over the world at this point. The coronavirus is everywhere. And again, um, it's not about fear. It's about poise in the face of the pirates, the coronavirus pirate, not panic, but informed decision-making with regard to all of this. And I want to show... Um, one more graphic here, which is pretty interesting. So I will screen share <clears throat> one more website, uh, coronavirus.1.3acres.com from slash EN, um, real-time updates of coronavirus levels in the United States and Canada. I found this interesting. You can see the cumulative cases in the United States, and it appears to be updated in real time. Um, as you can see here on 316, when this is being recorded, uh, there are 889 new cases, cumulative 4,681 cases in the United States. And you can also see that cumulative cases, new cases, you can see the trend here, right? So what I am looking at most when I am thinking about the coronavirus uh, for our country is how many new cases are reported each day. Uh, you can see that this line continues to rise. Uh, this orange line continues to rise, meaning that we are appearing to still be in an exponential growth phase, which is what we don't want. We want this line to flatten out. That is the flattening of the curve that we are hoping for. So what I want to see is that over the next few days, this number of new cases starts to level off. Yesterday, it was 779. Day before that, 723. Day before that, 567. The next five to six days, I will be watching this website to see how many new cases arise. Today was over 100 more than yesterday, and this number may continue to rise throughout the day. 
So this is why we need over the next five to six days to really calm down the way we're moving. But I think it's interesting to see how many of these new cases are happening all the time in our country. So I want to talk about a few more things and then move on to the last part of this week's podcast. Thanks for bearing with me, you guys. This is a challenging one to like juggle it all and uh, do it all. But I hope there's some valuable information in here. I want to share a couple of articles I've seen. The first one is about um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, I have not been able to find or see the actual uh, paper that is associated with this. But as you will see, this is an article from The Guardian in the UK, uh, that anti-inflammatories may aggravate COVID-19, France advisors. The French minister says one says patients should take paracetamol rather than ibuprofen or cortisone. Paracetamol is acetaminophen. Uh, acetaminophen is uh, uh, Tylenol. It has a different mechanism of action than the non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which are ibuprofen, or the glucocorticoids, which are cortisone. Uh, I don't think we know how to treat uh, SARS-CoV-2 at this point. Uh, in the critical care setting, we have to defer to the critical care specialists. People are using things like chloroquine, antivirals, which I'll mention in a moment, and steroids. And I don't think we know what is working the best. But um, I think that one thing to be aware of for those of us who are uh, probably not going to go to the hospital is that there is some suggestion that ibuprofen to lower a fever may worsen this infection. So I will say something now that will be my opinion uh, and should not be misconstrued as medical advice, but I think that in adult humans, when we get a fever, we should probably not take a medication to lower this. As I'll talk about in the last part of this podcast, there is some evidence with regard to flu and other viruses that a higher body temperature, whether it's achieved through a sauna uh, or uh, through a uh, normal pyretic response, a normal fever response in human physiology, may interfere with viral replication is probably a good thing. So when we are getting a fever, should we be lowering this with a medication? I'm not sure we should. Uh, that is my opinion. Uh, this is not medical advice for anyone listening to this, but I think that uh, you should educate yourself if you have a fever, how you are going to react to that. Uh, furthermore, I will say that acetaminophen, or in this article, what they are calling paracetamol, depletes glutathione, which is probably a very important thing to have in your body, which as you will know, if you've read my book, The Carnivore Code, any of my other stuff, is this endogenous antioxidant in humans that is very important for antioxidant function, endogenous antioxidant function, and oxidation reduction balance in the human physiology. So taking non-steroidals is probably a bad idea with this. We don't know for sure. And again, I don't have a specific article here, just a newspaper report from the French minister and um, the physicians in that country who are appearing to suggest that there is an issue with these medications. Uh, so we probably should not be taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. This would be ibuprofen, naproxen, or Aleve, Motrin. These are probably not a good idea to lower our fever in the setting of coronavirus. I think a lot of people will not do this, but I wanted to at least put this possibility out there for all to see. Um, again, I'm not necessarily sure we'd be taking Tylenol either for this. Um, in kids, occasionally we give Tylenol if they're going to have a febrile seizure. But again, children appear to be much less affected by this virus, at least according to what we know on March 16th, 2020. I also want to mention a little bit about the ACE inhibitors. Uh, there are a couple of articles that I will put on the screen that I can try and link to in the show notes. This one is the physician statement of the European Society of Cardiology on hypertension and ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, this is from the 13th of March, and they say that based on initial reports from China and subsequent evidence that arterial hypertension may be associated with increased risk of mortality in hospitalized COVID-19 infected subjects, hypotheses have been put forward to suggest a potential adverse effect of angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, and this is where we don't know what's going on. This is why I spent so much time talking about the ACE2 receptor at the beginning of this podcast, uh, which could interact with these medications. The mainstream medical consensus is not to stop these medications if you are on them. Um, 
but we can all draw hypotheses from this and decide what we want to do. I don't know what to do in this case. Nobody knows what to do. Is it possible that the ACE2 receptors are upregulated when we are taking drugs that downregulate angiotensin 2, as I described earlier with those mechanisms? It's possible. Could that increase the infectivity of SARS? It could. Um, could stopping ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, if you have hypertension, be dangerous? Yes, it could. I'm just putting these out there for people to think about. The, um, the position statement from the European Society of Cardiology is that we should not be stopping these medications. And as a uh, prelude to what I will talk about in the last part of this podcast, I think that one, we do know that people with hypertension are affected more uh, severely than those without but the majority of hypertension we see is related to insulin resistance. Diabetics are also affected. People with heart disease are also affected. Those conditions all have insulin resistance in common. So perhaps we should focus on insulin resistance and that gets us back to diet and what causes insulin resistance, which I will talk about momentarily. But ACE and ARBs and uh, coronavirus, we don't know what is going on here. Another article from, uh, this is a nephrology, uh, site, uh, the Nephrology uh, JC site, which I believe is a nephrology journal um, or a blog. Now, the coronavirus conundrum, ACE2 and hypertension edition. And so many people are thinking about this um, and there is information here. They are not advised to change their therapy unless advised to do so by their physician. Um, but we should all be thinking about how the coronavirus may be interacting with this ACE2 receptor. But you can see all of these positions are here on this page. Mostly everyone, in fact, everyone is recommending continuing these medications, but we are learning uh, what to do and how this might affect uh, coronavirus infectivity if you are on things like lisinopril, losartan, et cetera, et cetera. Know the medications you are on here uh, with regard to these issues. So let's move on to thinking a little bit about who is most affected by this virus, and then we will close the podcast with some consideration of nutritional interventions, or I should say nutritional um, considerations with regard to immunologic function. So I think that the first thing to consider in this situation is the demographics, the epidemiology of who is getting sick with coronavirus, and what do we know? So I'll, I'll share a couple of articles here on the screen share. Characteristics and Important Lessons from the Coronavirus Disease 2019 Outbreak in China. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association, published on February 24th, 2020. So it's a couple weeks old. This is a summary of 72,314 cases from the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And if you look at the epidemiologic characteristics, as of February 11th, so a month ago in China, which is our sort of model system for all of this, there were over 72,000 cases. There were <clears throat> 44,000 confirmed cases, 16,000 suspected, there were 10,000 diagnosed, and there were uh, about 900 asymptomatic. So 87% of those infected were 30 to 79 years old. That's not super helpful because it's a large age range, but we'll see the age distribution uh, a little more detail in a moment. 8% uh, were 20 to 29 years, 1% were 10 to 19, and less than 10 were 1%. So again, less than 20 years old in China was very rare. But if you look at, even though they grouped this 30 to 79 year old group together, and 80, 87% were in that age group, 81% of the cases were mild, 14% were severe, and 5% were critical. Now, it's hard to know what exactly those things mean, but in China, the critical number appears to mean needing ventilation. So 5% of those people needed ventilation. Um, in this case, the case fatality rate was 2.3%, which is 1,000 patients of 44,672 confirmed. And you can see here that 14.8, uh, and it was much higher, the case fatality rate was much higher in patients who were greater than 80 and significantly higher in patients who were 70 to 79 years old, which is some of the most telling data. Um, the healthcare personnel infection rates are here. They are... Um, uh, small in the overall numbers, but large in Wuhan, where I believe there was not use of personal protective equipment in the beginning, okay? So what do we take away from this? 
this and other studies suggest to us, and I can show other studies that give a little more detail, that the majority of people who are suffering from this illness are uh, in the older age brackets. And I believe this is correlated with uh, people in those older age brackets being slightly more frail and being uh, a little bit less robust overall. I also wanna share a couple of other studies um, that give us a sense of severity and comorbidity, which may be helpful. Let's uh, start with this one from The Lancet, which is uh, again published on March the 11th, 2020. So this one is much more recent, but is again looking at a much smaller um, case series from Wuhan. And this is 191 patients, um, 135 from uh, Jinyan Tan and 56 from Wuhan. And uh, 37, 137 were discharged, 54 died in the hospital. And interesting to note here, 48% of patients had a comorbidity with hypertension being the most common and diabetes and coronary heart disease following thereafter. Uh, they did multivariable regression showing increased odds of in-hospital death associated with one older age with an odds ratio of... Um, uh, 1.10, I believe. Um, yes, uh, an odds ratio of 1.10 per year increase. So that was that for every, there was an odds ratio of 1.1 increase for every year increase in age. So as people got older, they were more susceptible to this virus. Uh, there was a higher sequential organ failure assessment score and a D-dimer greater than one microgram per ml were all concerning and were more uh, indicative or predictive of in-hospital death. Interestingly, as I talked about earlier, the mean duration of viral shedding was 20 days in survivors. Um, and in those people who died, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus was detectable the entire time. The longest observed duration of viral shedding was 37 days. So interesting study because it points out all of those comorbidities and how prevalent they were. And we can talk about why that may be. There were a couple of charts in this that I wanted to show. Again, these are the demographics, okay? So uh, again, this is a smaller study, uh, 191 people of which there were 137 survivors, 54 non-survivors. It's important to remember that if someone's getting admitted to one of these hospitals, they probably had a pretty severe infection. So these uh, rates of survival are uh, not indicative of the general population, just of hospitalized patients. Uh, the age of the survivors was lower. The age of the non-survivors, uh, I believe this is a, um, the mean is 69 years. The mean of the survivors was 52 years. Again, one of the things that's been interesting that people have noted is that males are more affected by this disease uh, than females. Again, females are the uh, minority in all of the groups. Um, the current smoker percentages are here, which are quite interesting. Obviously, the current smoker percentage was uh, higher in the non-survivor group, but was actually only 9% of that group relative to 4% of the survivor group. Comorbidities were present in 67% of the non-survivor group. So almost 70% of the non-survivor group had a comorbidity and 40% of the survivor group had a comorbidity. So pretty significant difference there. Hypertension was found in 48% of the non-survivors versus 23% of the survivors. <clears throat> Diabetes in 31% of the survivors versus 14% of the non-survivor, excuse me. Diabetes, 31% of the non-survivors, 14% of the survivors. Again, coronary heart disease, 24% of the non-survivors had coronary heart disease, at least already diagnosed, perhaps they had more. Only 1% of the survivors had coronary heart disease. So uh, again, pretty small numbers there, but it's really contrasting the difference between survivors and non-survivors in these studies. You can see chronic lung disease, again, much higher in the non-survivors, chronic kidney disease, and other chronic diseases, much higher in the non-survivors. Um, you can see pulse, systolic blood pressure, fever temperatures, um, about the same in both groups. So there's no difference in the fever. They had about the same percentage of cough. The symptoms weren't that different. Fatigue, diarrhea, none of those symptoms were that different between survivors and non-survivors. But again, 
some of those scoring ranges were much higher in the non-survivors, which are laboratory measures, things that would only be able to be measured in the hospital once anyone arrived there. But um, that was quite interesting. You can look here, other laboratory abnormalities in these people, this may get a little esoteric. Obviously the white blood cell counts were higher in the people who did not survive. Um, and uh, lymphocyte counts were lower. Uh, so you can see that there are laboratory abnormalities. People can predict this based on these issues and based on what they see in the blood work. Uh, liver enzymes appeared to be more elevated in the people who did not survive, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm sure the labs pretty much look like they were generally worse across the board, especially the D-dimer, which is an indication of sort of clotting and the lysis of clots in the human body. It's a measure that we will often use for uh, something like a pulmonary embolism uh, when we are uh, working with clients and thinking about that. But the D-dimer was elevated in these patients. So these are sort of things for healthcare practitioners rather than uh, lay people listening to this. But uh, the differences between those people were very interesting. It's also interesting to note that a lot of people got antibiotics in both groups, that the non-survivor group and the survivor group got antibiotics. And you know that, that this, a lot of the survivors got antibiotics, a lot of the non-survivors got antibiotics. Who knows if those are helpful? Uh, a lot of, they both, they equally got antivirals. Uh, the non-survivor group got more corticosteroids. That may either indicate that the corticosteroids were not a good in intervention or that they were more severe <laughs> and therefore required more corticosteroids because of the way they were progressing on ventilation. So it's hard to make a uh, mention of what to do with those corticosteroids, um, et cetera. You can also see that intravenous immunoglobulins were given to a much higher percentage of the non-survivors. Again, that may just indicate that they were more severe rather than that is a bad thing for them to get while they're in the hospital. So that's an interesting article. And then I will share one more here, which is um, clinical characteristics of 138 hospitalized patients with the uh, novel 2019 coronavirus in Wuhan. And this one is from the Journal of the American, Medi Journal of the American Medical Association. The previous one was from The Lancet. And this one is looking at the epidemiological, demographic, clinical, laboratory, radiological, and treatment data. They had 138 hospitalized patients. The median age in this study was 56 years. And um, again, you can look at this on the paper if you guys are interested. The, the previous paper from Lancet was more telling. This one generally um, talks about the laboratory abnormalities, says that many of the patients got um, antiviral therapy with os uh, oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu, uh, they've received antibacterial therapy with moxifloxacin, ceftriaxone, azithromycin, glucocorticoid therapy in variable percentages. Um, many of them went to the ICU, um, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, um, this one, in this study, the mortality rate was 4.3%, uh, which is that sort of case fatality rate that we were talking about earlier. But again, it's possibly skewed by the fact that the patients that end up in the hospital are the patients that are more severe. What I wanted to emphasize with those two things, especially the first one, was really that the comorbidities are what we're seeing in these hospitalized patients. So let's just think about those a little bit and think about how to incorporate that stuff into our lives and um, what that means for all of us with regard to this virus and illness in general. Okay, so to really drive this point home regarding the comorbidities, I wanna share a couple more studies that have been done. This one is, uh, not peer-reviewed. There are many of these preprint studies that are now being talked about. The benefit of this is that they are coming out very quickly. This one is posted February 27th, 2020. It's all happening so fast that we can't peer-review all the papers. This is comorbidity and its impact on 1,590 patients with COVID-19 in China, a nationwide analysis. The take-home message here is that a large number of patients had comorbidities, okay? Just like we were saying before. So uh, with the composite endpoints here, uh, they say 25.1% reported having at least one comorbidity, which included hypertension, cardiovascular disease, cerebrovascular diseases, diabetes, hepatitis B, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, chronic kidney diseases, malignancy, and immunodeficiency, okay? 8.2% reported having two or more comorbidities, and patients with two or more of these issues had significantly escalated risks of reaching uh, the composite endpoint compared with those who had a single comorbidity 
and even more so as compared to those without uh, any comorbidities. The composite endpoints were um, the uh, were the admission to the intensive care unit, invent invasive ventilation, or death. So the more comorbidities you had, the worse you did out of those. Um, they found that the hazard ratios uh, for uh, COPD was 2.6, diabetes 1.59, hypertension 1.58, malignancy 3.50, which is a pretty big hazard ratio, um, 3.5x uh, um, uh, the risk. So we're more likely to reach the composite endpoints than those without. You can imagine that someone with malignancy uh, probably has a disordered immune system as well. So that was interesting in terms of the Chinese patients, again, reinforcing the fact that comorbidities are a big deal here. Last paper <clears throat> with regard to uh, what we know from Wuhan, this one was published on March 13th, 2020. This is actually in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So this one is peer reviewed. And this is risk factors associated with acute respiratory distress syndrome which is ARDS. Remember earlier I talked about the filling up of the lungs when the surfactant goes away from these type 2 pneumocytes. That leads to ARDS. Um, and what they found, this was a study involving 201 patients with confirmed uh, SARS-CoV-2 pneumonia. And they found that risk factors associated with the development of acute respiratory distress syndrome and progression from ARDS to death included older age, neutrophilia, which is the increased amounts of neutrophils, which is a white blood cell in the body and organ and coagulation dysfunction. Uh, so they found that the people who were more likely to progress to those things had more, more comorbidities as well. Um, older age associated with a greater risk of developing ARDS owing, uh, they say, likely to less rigorous immune response uh, and I would say that is likely connected with nutritional status, which we will talk about as we close this podcast. And it says um, there were other uh, concerns with other comorbidities in this study as well. Diabetes, um, hypertension, again, and heart disease were more uh, robustly represented. So hypertension uh, in 27.4% um, and diabetes in a large number as well. Specifically, I am looking for the number. Um, diabetes in 19% of the patients uh, in this uh, survey. So higher than normal um, in this survey went to ARDS and the comorbidities were a big factor in this position. So what do we know about diabetes and hypertension? We know these are related to insulin resistance. Why is insulin resistance a big deal? What do we know about diabetes in general? Do we know that people with diabetes have impaired immune systems? Yes, we do. This has been widely discussed and is um, pretty widely accepted to be the case, um, probably having to do with insulin signaling in T cells. So uh, this is a paper called Immune Dysfunction in Patients with Diabetes Mellitus. Uh, it's from Immunology and Medical Microbiology. It's from December 1999, obviously not published in the wake of coronavirus, but still relevant to what we are talking about today. And it is in this paper, as you will see, they suggest that um, there, is, there are uh, disturbances in humoral innate immunity have been described in diabetic patients. So there, are, uh, there is both adaptive and innate immunity in um, humans. We don't have to go into those details now, but uh, deficiencies are described in the immune systems of diabetics. Uh, they say cellular uh, concerning cellular innate immunity, most studies show decreased functions. Chemotaxis, which is the movement of cells, phagocytosis, killing of uh, diabetic polymorphonuclear cells, which are um, neutrophils, and uh, diabetic monocytes or macrophages compared to the cells of controls. So multiple cells of diabetics within the immune system are more sluggish. Basically, they have slow cells. And why might this be? I don't think we fully understand, but what we know um, from, I believe, what our animal studies is that, um, as we can see here in this next study, um, insulin receptor 
uh, mediated stimulation boosts T cell immunity during inflammation and infection. Um, so what they are saying here is that insulin signaling is needed for an immune response. What do we know about diabetes? What do we know about heart disease? What do we know about um, hypertension in many cases is there is insulin resistance. So I talked about insulin resistance on previous podcasts. I talk about it in my book, The Carnivore Code. Basically what is happening in a state of insulin resistance and in the book and in many of these other uh, forums, I have discussed why this may happen, but these cells are not as responsive to the actions of insulin, probably coming from mitochondrial signaling, telling them to refuse the actions of insulin. But when we get systemic insulin resistance during times of inflammation or during times of, uh, again, I guess if we're talking about diabetes, it would be metabolic dysfunction, then cells are not responding to insulin as well. And the signaling from insulin at the level of the cell, specifically in this case, at the level of immune cells is significantly impaired. So as you'll see in this paper here, if you were watching the YouTube video, insulin receptor signaling controls T-cell proliferation and cytokine production. T-cell intrinsic insulin resistance dampens T-cell pro-inflammatory function. T-cell insulin receptor stimulation drives protective immunity against influenza. And insulin receptor uh, modulates T-cell function through controlling cell metabolism. So this is a problem for people when they are insulin resistant. Again, this um, I believe is a uh, study done in uh, mouse models, but is probably very applicable to humans um, in terms of insulin related physiology. So I find these analyses very interesting because I'm not sure that there are many in the space talking about these comorbidities. Certainly there has been lots of talk about hypertension, this ACE2 receptor, like we talked about earlier in the podcast, a lot of hypertension is also driven by insulin resistance. But then the major question for us becomes, why are people with insulin resistance more uh, susceptible to this virus? Are there a lot of people who have insulin resistance that we're not checking for, which I think is definitely the case. As I talk about in the book, and as I have described many times on my social media, there are good studies to suggest that now 40% of the American population is obese, our population here may be hit much harder with coronavirus than um, other populations because we are more obese in general and with obesity often comes insulin resistance. And furthermore, the idea that um, in our country there is a lot of insulin resistance and a lot of people are not aware they are insulin resistant. As I talk about in the book with this one study, when we are looking at certain metrics of metabolic syndrome, low HDL, hypertension, uh, metabolic dyslipidemia, high triglycerides, uh, all of these issues, increased waist circumference. Uh, when we look at those criteria for metabolic dysfunction, 88% of the U.S. population meet those criteria. This is the reason for the tweet that I did and the Instagram post I did when I suggested that perhaps the best way to combat coronavirus would be to stay in the 12% of the population who were metabolically healthy, right? We don't want to be insulin resistant, but 88% of the United States is insulin resistant. So when we get this virus, many people may be problem, maybe they have problems. Now with that suggest, with that tweet, with that Instagram post, I was not suggesting that we shouldn't do social distancing or hand washing. I was saying that as humans, uh, we're, we're, you know, outside of those epidemiologic measures, the population measures, the public health measures, we should be thinking about remaining in the part of the population that is insulin sensitive. How do we avoid insulin resistance? I talk all about this in my book. If you want to know more about it, check it out. I think that there are many ways to avoid insulin resistance that begin with not eating processed foods, especially processed carbohydrates in conjunction with vegetable oils. I want to make it very clear that I do not believe that carbohydrates cause insulin resistance per se. I definitely see people on Instagram sometimes saying that carbs are toxic, and this is just false. Like, I have never said that. I do not believe that carbohydrates are toxic for humans. I think that the source of carbohydrates is very important, but I don't think we need to be ketogenic during a coronavirus outbreak. I don't think we need to be fasting during a coronavirus outbreak. I think we need to have nutrient-rich food and be doing things that we enjoy, and I think we need to remain insulin sensitive. Now, removal of carbohydrates from the diet can improve insulin sensitivity in many people, but it is not required. We can still include 
good sources of carbohydrates. In the book, I give a plant toxicity spectrum. Um, obviously, the most toxic carbohydrates are going to be processed carbohydrates. When you go to the grocery stores right now, what is going on? What are people buying from the shelves? They are buying processed carbohydrates and bread, and they are buying pasta. That is not what we want. Processed carbohydrates, this is not the podcast for that, but processed carbohydrates appear to clearly affect our insulin signaling and cause insulin resistance at a much more in a much more robust way, in a much more aggressive way than uh, carbohydrates that are normally found in, I would say, things like squash or uh, avocado, which is low in carbohydrates, et cetera, et cetera. So berries, um, fruit is probably fine, but processed carbohydrates, flours, grains, these are not a good thing for humans, in my opinion. They should not represent a large part of the diet, especially not in conjunction with vegetable oils. So how do you avoid insulin resistance? Number one, you don't want to be overweight. You don't want visceral adiposity, but visceral adiposity is often connected with eating the wrong types of foods in people who can't handle that. In the book, as I say, uh, this is the connection or the conjunction, uh, the consumption of processed carbohydrates and fat together. That is going to cause insulin resistance for us in general as a human people. Eating non-processed foods is going to be a huge help to us and eating nutrient-rich foods. So the first part of this nutrition conversation was again highlighting that we are more susceptible or humans, at least in China and other countries, we have most of the data from China, appear to be more susceptible to coronavirus when they are insulin resistant. We know that by looking at the comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, all of which are clearly connected with insulin resistance on and on. Obesity is probably a big factor. Again, there's lots of obesity. How do we change that? with non-processed carbohydrates, uh, as I talk about in the book, low toxicity carbohydrates, squash, avocado, berries. There are good sources of carbohydrates in the human diet, or we can do low carb diets if we prefer to do that. I don't think that's required uh, for the human diet. And again, I wanna be very clear, I do not think carbohydrates are toxic for humans, nor do they cause diabetes uh, de facto that is the overconsumption of processed carbohydrates in connection with processed vegetable oils generally that I think is the biggest problem for most people with regard to that. So let's move on to the final, final, final section of this podcast. I want to highlight a few papers talking about nutrient adequacy and immunologic function and give some sense of where we go from here. So even though this has turned into a very long podcast, this is the part of the podcast that I wanted to talk about the most because this and avoiding insulin resistance are the things that we can do in this situation to improve our outcome and the outcome of our parents and grandparents who be maybe more frail and susceptible to coronavirus. This is what we can do before we get sick. Uh, this is not going to be a podcast about nutraceuticals. If you want to take vitamin C, that is fine. This is not a podcast about elderberry or any of these other things. Other podcasts have been done on that. This is a podcast about micronutrients from whole food. Uh, I am actually not a huge fan of using tons of supplements right now. I think we should be eating good food and we should not need to have lots of supplements to increase our immune function. I saw someone post today supplements for acute immune uh, improvements and I thought, you know, I just don't buy yet that we can acutely improve our immune function in a positive way with echinacea or any of these other things. I'm open to the possibility, but I think that what is much more interesting to me is how we improve our immune system with adequate micronutrient status. It's not a quick fix. It's good food throughout our lifespan and avoidance of insulin, sens insulin resistance. So I'll go through a few papers here and then we will wrap this up. So first paper, this is well known, you guys. It is really not questionable. Immune function and micronutrient requirements change over the life course. This is from 2018. Various micronutrients are essential for immunocompetence, which means a healthy functioning immune system, particularly vitamins A, C, D, E, B2, which is riboflavin, B6, which is pyridoxine, B12, folic acid, which does not occur in nature. It should be folate iron, selenium, and zinc. This is an incomplete list, of course, but let's just talk about these in general quickly. Vitamin A. Where do we get vitamin A from as humans? As I talk about in the book, if we want to get vitamin A from plants, we have to realize that every unit of beta carotene must be converted to retinol vitamin A, and that generally conversion rates are 
1 to 21 for that conversion, meaning that we need 21 units of beta carotene to make one unit of retinol vitamin A. So if you see a vitamin A requirement on sweet potatoes, you have to divide that by 21 and make sure that you are getting enough vitamin A from plants to meet your vitamin A requirement. It's much easier to get preformed vitamin A from animal foods, as I talk about in my book, The Carnivore Code. This is liver, this is egg yolks. Vitamin A is crucial for immune function. How many of the people hospitalized in China do you think have vitamin A deficiency? I think a lot. Vitamin C is important. Again, if you want to supplement vitamin C, that is fine. I won't go into all of the vitamin C literature here. Generally speaking, in the past, supplementation with vitamin C has failed to prevent the common cold. This is not the common cold. We don't know what's going on. This is probably a time to have adequate vitamin C status. Again, I continue to believe we can get adequate vitamin C status from animal foods. If you want to supplement vitamin C, that is fine. Vitamin D is crucial for this. The question on my mind is whether or not we can get all the things we need in a vitamin D supplement. That is, is vitamin D in these studies just a proxy for sun exposure? I would much rather get my vitamin D from ultraviolet light. And we know that many of these infections are seasonal, tending to uh, become less intense in the summer months, perhaps connected with rising vitamin D, perhaps connected with other benefits of ultraviolet light. I think that I prefer to get my vitamin D from ultraviolet sources. I've talked about this repeatedly on other podcasts. If you do not have access to the sun right now, you could consider other sources of real vitamin D that is ultraviolet light, like a spare T UV lamp, S-P-E-R-T-I UV lamp. Um, I do think we need vitamin D, but I also think we need ultraviolet light for immune function. These are non-negotiable. Vitamin E, there is lots of vitamin E in animal foods, as I've talked about in the book and many other places. When I look at carnivore diets, people have tons of vitamin E in their body. It's probably an animal fat and animal meat. Vitamin B2, I also talk about in the book. This is riboflavin. There are not great sources of riboflavin in the plant kingdom. If you want to get adequate riboflavin, I feel strongly this will come from animal foods, specifically liver and heart. Uh, B6 is pyridoxine. Again, in the book, I specifically mention studies in which uh, there is a pyridoxine glucoside in, which, uh, in plants, which makes pyridoxine much less bioavailable. B12, we know, is not found in plant foods. Folate is found in plant foods, but I believe it is more uh, robust and bioavailable in animal foods. Iron is, of course, much more bioavailable in animal foods. Selenium, also more bioavailable in animal foods. Any of the minerals are going to be more bioavailable in animal foods because they are not chelated by phytic acid and oxalates. Finally, zinc, much more bioavailable in animal foods. In fact, in the book, I discuss a study in which oysters were administered with and without black beans and tortillas. Oysters are one of the richest sources of zinc. Without black beans or tortillas, zinc levels rose strikingly. And with those foods, zinc levels were uh, significantly lower. In fact, with both of those foods, zinc levels did not rise at all when zinc was administered. How can we have a healthy immune system without eating animals? This is my concern. This is my message. No matter what infection we are looking at, we need to consider the immune system very carefully. And we need to have adequate amounts of all of these vitamins and minerals. And I really believe that animal foods are the best sources of these vitamins and minerals. I've never claimed that a carnivore diet can cure coronavirus, but I definitely will say that if you are eating an animal-rich diet, I believe your immune system will be better equipped because you will be more nutrient adequate and you will likely be less insulin resistant. And I do not think that is a controversial statement in 2020. And I think that if anything, this is the time to know where your nutrients are coming from and to do your research. A few more papers here. Nutritional modulation of immune function, analysis of evidence, mechanisms, and clinical relevance. This is from January of 2019, Frontiers in Immunology. It is well established that the nutritional deficiency or inadequacy can impair immune functions is the first sentence of the abstract. These researchers note omega-3s, micronutrients, zinc, vitamins D, and vitamin E, and also probiotics. And they talk about T components and their immunologic effects. I don't have time in this podcast to go into T components. In the book, I discuss some concerns about T components, but if you believe T components are improving your immune system, by all means, use them at this point. But don't forget about zinc, D, and E, and realize they are much more bioavailable 
from animal foods. The previous study did not talk about omega-3s, but guess what? Alpha linolenic acid from plant foods is not gonna get converted to EPA and DHA very well. Uh, excuse me, yeah, DHA very well. Animal foods are your best source. A few more papers. The immune nutrition interplay in aging, facts and controversies. Um, basically, nutrition influences immunity in multiple ways with multiple nutrients affecting many immune parameters. For anyone in the health space to say that there is no connection between diet and immunity is ludicrous, right? There is no conversation around coronavirus with any of these nutrients. This is what I was talking about on my Instagram. This is the podcast that I wanted to do, you guys. And it, unfortunately, I'll probably have to do a whole other podcast about this. I don't want to take this podcast any longer, but I, I don't think that anyone can debate this, that nutritional adequacy is tantamount in this equation, okay? A few more studies, nutrition and immune responses. What do we know? This is from uh, Military Strategies for the Sustainment of Nutrition and Immune Function in the Field. Again, it's very clear that, um, uh, that deficiencies, similar alterations in immune responses have been reported with deficiencies in individual nutrients, such as protein, fatty acids, vitamin A, vitamin E, pyridoxine, which is B6, folic acid, which is say folate, zinc, iron, copper, selenium. Basically the same ones we talked about in the previous study, but add to that protein. If you don't get enough protein, your immune system isn't functioning. If you are eating 30 grams of protein right now because you are worried about mTOR, start eating more protein and get it from animal sources and look at the material that I have put out and other people have put out showing that we should not be worried about mTOR. So all of the people in the health community who are worried about mTOR right now are doing low protein diets. There is a potential that their immune system response is impaired because of that choice. In the book, I talk about this as well. I hope you guys will check it out. Clearly, many of these themes are elaborated on in the carnivore code, um, but at least listen to this podcast and nurture yourself with animal foods. Plant foods are not as bioavailable in terms of protein. I've talked about that in detail. You can look at the DIAS score. James Wilkes was dead wrong about this on Joe Rogan. End of story. All right, a couple more and then we'll wrap up here, you guys. Um, mechanisms of nutrient modulation in the immune response. This is um, molecular mechanisms in allergy and clinical immunology. Basically, we are seeing the same things in this paper that nutrients act as antioxidants and as cofactors at the level of cytokine regulation, protein calorie malnutrition and zinc deficiency activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, increased circulating levels of glucocorticoids cause thymic atrophy and affect hematopoiesis, the thymus is the gland in the chest where immune system uh, cells are programmed. Hematopoiesis is the formation of uh, red blood cells, uh, cells in general in the, in the bone marrow and other uh, glands. Chronic undernutrition and micronutrient deficiency compromise cytokine response and affect immune cell trafficking. Basically, the combination of chronic undernutrition and infection, and infection further weakens the immune system, leading to altered immune cell populations and a generalized increase in inflammatory mediators. Obesity caused by excess nutrition or excess storage of fats relative to energy expenditure is a form of malnutrition that is increasingly seen in children. This is insulin resistance. It's also seen in adults. Anyway, you guys can check out this paper. All of the nutritional literature agrees. There is no doubt here, you guys. We need these nutrients to have a healthy immune system and I challenge you to get them without animal foods. Animal foods are a critical portion of the diet. So my hypothesis is this. Again, like I said in the beginning of this podcast, the second part of this podcast is real speculation. We don't have studies on zinc and omega-3 with coronavirus, but I think we can connect the dots pretty well here, you guys. We need a healthy immune system. We need to avoid insulin resistance. There are many ways to achieve that. A carnivore diet, a carnivorous diet, paleolithic diet, a ketogenic diet, there are many ways to achieve that. I am not claiming a carnivore diet cures coronavirus, nor have I ever claimed that, but I am absolutely claiming that nutritional adequacy matters in this time, especially with regard to coronavirus. So this podcast has been huge. It's been long. I hope it's been helpful, you guys. I will do more if you guys like it. If you guys have more questions about coronavirus and you want me to answer them, I will be doing lives every day. This podcast will hopefully be out on Tuesday. Um, so let's just summarize where we've been, all right? I love the Thich Nhat Hanh quote to begin the podcast. 
And I can repeat it so that we can remember this moving forward. When the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remained calm and centered, it was enough. It showed the way for everyone to survive. May we all remain calm and centered. May we all know that we have power in the face of this tragedy, this crisis, or this wake-up call to us as a society. May we all know that we have power for our loved ones as well. And that by getting them more nutrients in whatever form you believe to be the best source of that, I certainly know what I believe to the best source, be the best source of that, that will be helpful for them. Getting them into the right environments will be helpful for them. Avoiding contact for them with infected people will be helpful as well. But we are powerful in the center of the storm. We can remain calm. One other issue that I did not discuss in this podcast is the difference between sort of the germ theory of disease and the host theory of disease. This is the argument between Pasteur and Beauchamp, Antoine Beauchamp. Now, essentially what happened here, and then I will close with this, I promise, is that Louis Pasteur believed that germs cause disease and that the virulence of the microbe was the main factor in a disease. Now, this is kind of true, but not entirely true. And we are learning today that the terrain, the adequacy of the host, the health of the host also matters. And the studies I showed with diabetics illustrate this beautifully. Many of the infections that diabetics suffer, the rest of us are always exposed to, and we don't have these infections. We all know that the terrain of the human body, the immunologic terrain matters. May we all have the best terrain, the least hospitable terrain for infectious agents in this time. And the way we get that is by not being insulin resistant, by being insulin sensitive, and by having lots of good nutrients in our diet. And as you all know, I strongly believe that means including animal foods in your diet in large amounts and organs. So hopefully this podcast is helpful, you guys. I apologize for how disjointed it was. Again, I've been kind of thinking about and marinating and just spent all my time over the last few days learning about coronavirus, thinking about how to present this information with regard to nutrients and nutrient adequacy, digging up tons of studies, and it's been kind of thrown together. Podcasts take a lot of time. Again, I apologize if it was disjointed, but hopefully it gives you a sense of where I think we are and where I think we can go. We will get through this. I know we will. I hope you are all healthy and happy with your families, and I hope you will all stay safe, and I hope you will all think of the people in your lives who are likely to be affected most by this virus and keep them safe and away from contacts and get them good nutrition as well. So thank you guys for listening. I hope this is helpful. I love you all. And I will talk to you soon. Stay radical.